A warm welcome uh, to this event, which is part of the Jean Monnet in the US series, hashtag JM in the US, with an impressive list of events that we have hosted with our EU funded network of universities across the United States. And today is a virtual event, which will last for about an hour with question and answer session towards the end of the event. If you would like to ask a question, please put it in the Zoom chat function, Q&A function, and submit that. Our answers to the questions will not be typed into the Q&A function, but there is closed caption which will operate. We ask that you do not record the session as the School of International Service will record the session and post it to the SIS YouTube channel. Our panelists today for the EU economic recovery post COVID are Ben Carlina, who is senior economist at the EU delegation to the United States here in Washington, DC. Chris Orsini, who is the counselor for economic and financial affairs at the EU delegation to the United States. And then we have three uh, professors who will serve as moderators, David Beery, Professor in the School of Public and International Affairs and Associate Professor of Economics at Virginia Tech. Deborah Glassman, Professor in the School of Business, the Foster School of Business at the University of Washington, Seattle. And my colleague, Steve Sylvia, Professor in the School of International Service and an Affiliate Professor in Economics. You are all most welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be part of this conversation about the pandemic and the EU economy. A reminder, if you have questions, put them into the Q&A function, and we will try to work them into the conversation. I'm going to ask Chris to get us started by telling us what were the shutdowns like in Europe and what were the immediate effects on the economy? So I'm taking you back a year. Right. Now, I think it's always good to, to look a little bit in the rear mirror before uh, looking ahead. So, uh, indeed, I mean, the, 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 I think the, you know, the shutdowns in, uh, in Europe were nothing like uh, they were in the United States. Uh, I, I, have, um, I happen to have an Italian and Swedish background. Uh, and I can say that, you know, the, the Americans thought that they were living in Italy, where actually they were more like following the Swedish model. Um, so we really had quite a, quite a variation of, on the spectrum. And uh, I, did, I did not mention these countries for Azar, because, because I mean, they do in a way, by chance, they do somehow represent, uh, um, you know, the, the lower or the higher spectrum, if you want. They were very, very stringent uh, in, in countries like Italy, but uh, uh, much, much less so in countries like, like, uh, like Sweden. Uh, but you know the difference were also had to do with the, with the timing uh, to some extent. I mean, uh, of course, there was not very much that was known in the, in the um, at the beginning of the of the uh, of the pandemic how exactly the virus was was transmitted, and uh, and of course, countries that were hit first tended to be much implement much more stringent uh, uh, measures than countries that sort of had 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 learned a little bit more from uh, from this process. So I think that is also something that that needed to uh, needs to be. Uh, uh, taken in, into account. Now, in terms of, of economic impact, um, um, maybe just to give like a little bit of, of an example of a flavor. I mean, in, in countries at the highest uh, of the of the stringency, in, in countries like Italy, it was actually forbidden to to um, to leave your your home. So it was really like a shelter in place, and and people would actually be fined for leaving their house if they would not have. Um, um, you know, a, a justification. And as we have evolved and become a little bit more smarter with this, of course, we have seen that, that some of the stringency measures have been much more, more targeted in terms of which sectors uh, and which kind of, of um, you know, situations they, they are, they are um, covering. Now, in terms of impact, also, I think there is, has been quite uh, economic impact, quite, quite a lot of difference. And, uh, and I would say one is, one driver, of course, has been how much the, the presence, just the sheer presence of the virus, you uh, know, some countries have been affected more more than others, and uh, and that has to in turn depends also, you know, with, with sometimes the, just the density of, of the places and, and other um, and other variables. Uh, um, 
But I think what is also important is the economic structure uh, of the of the different uh, EU member states. Uh, uh, and of course, some countries are much more reliant on those contact intensive sectors. Uh, tourism is one of one, but you know, the whole uh, um, you know, hospitality sector, restaurants, et cetera, entertainment, uh, and those countries have been affected, affected more. And I think this is a very important difference. The other difference probably, and this is probably something that you can see also in the United States, where those countries which, which rely more on, on tourism have been affected, sorry, those states have been affected more than, than the average. The other one is probably it has to do a little bit more with just how the labor market functions and how, how flexible it is. And, and we know that, you know, countries that you have a lot of uh, um, self-employment or also temporary contracts, it was more difficult to, to put in place structure that, that you know, or, or system that would shelter uh, this kind of, kind of workers. And they have had at least a bit more of an impact on the, on the labor market. So all in all, I would say, uh, you know, a very um, granular picture. Uh, but I think it is fair also to say, at least in a, in a, in a you know, comparing big aggregates, uh, that the measures were on average much, much more stringent in Europe than they were in the United States. And of course, as a consequence, the economic impact has been, has been greater. With, with that context, I'm going to turn to Ben and ask, in terms of macroeconomic indicators, of what, what numbers should we look at to understand the medium term impacts, you know, what's been happening over the past year? Well, you know, I think that there's been a lot of attention put on, you know, high frequency indicators to get a sense of where things are right now. And, and we've seen a lot of uh, impressive use of credit card data and Google mm -hmm. mobility and, and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's very interesting and it's very useful for forecasters who are trying to predict what you know, the Q2 numbers are going to be or, or what the overall GDP uh, growth rates are, are, are going to be like. But you know, basically, it's, it's a very similar story in the, in the United States as in Europe. So in the second quarter of last year, you had this you know, unbelievable, historically un, almost unprecedented contraction that was the biggest decline uh, certainly since World War II, but you know the the data from from pre-war data wasn't as good, so it, it could even have been as bad as some of the worst quarters we saw in the Great Depression. Um, and then you know there's been a a, a pretty significant recovery since then. Um, the the most recent waves of the increases in infections uh, have slowed growth again and they slowed growth in Europe a little bit more than in the United States, um, in part because, as Chris was saying, the containment measures have tended to be a bit stricter. But in this most recent round, I think we have seen that people are learning how to live with the pandemic a little bit better. So the, um, you know, the, the decline in growth in the fourth quarter probably wasn't as bad as people were initially expecting. Um, and we are gonna see, you know, a pretty solid rebound in growth this year in, in the Euro area and, and, and the EU, it's going to be, I forget the exact number, 3.7% for the EU, 3.8% is what the European Commission is calling for this year, uh, and 3.9 and 3.8 next year. We'll, th those numbers might be revised up a little bit. We'll, we'll see when the spring forecast comes out. Um, but, you know, it's been quite a roller coaster ride. And I would say that we should be cautiously optimistic about the outlook right now, but it still is very dependent on what happens with the pandemic, uh, you know, how much the, the current wave of infections slows things down and how quickly we get the vaccine rolled out. And that's really, you know, the main thing in the near term is that, is that everyone has to, you know, implement, get shots in people's arms, and the sooner that that happens, the better, and, and we can return to normal. So, so it's looking good, but there's still some challenges, and it's all about you know the pandemic still. You both mentioned some comparisons to the U.S., and there are some strong similarities. Uh, if we're looking specifically at the labor market, that can we do a across the Atlantic comparison with labor market indicators? What are the effects of the pandemic on employment? 
maybe I'll, I'll give a first, a first shot of, of, at this. Um, I think we can definitely have, uh, you know, some indicators, we look at some indicators, they point at the very similar picture in terms of what's happened. If you look at others indicators, they tell, you know, completely divergent stories. So I think it's, it's important to, to uh, understand what, what we are talking about. So I think it's sort of in narrative terms, what happens was, of course, when, when all these uh, um, containment measures were put in place, we saw a drastic reduction of economic activity. And, and that drastic reduction of economic activity can be seen, for example, in the uh, fall in amount of hours work that, that just collapsed in, in, the, in the quarter, in the second, uh, yeah, especially between the first and the second quarter of, of last year. And that collapse is, is of a similar order of magnitude, you know, and, and in a way tracks very much that the collapse of, uh, of GDP in that, in, that, uh, in that same period. Now, when you look at, at others indicators, which is probably the most useful, uh, most used is the unemployment rate, then we see uh, really something which is completely, uh, completely different. Um, and I think, you know, this speaks very much to, to just the way the labor market uh, and some of the, 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 what we call sort of, um, automatic stabilizers, but I think probably, um, uh, you know, uh, social systems, social, uh, it's, it's, it was a way better way of, of capturing it works in, in extending support in times of, of crisis. Um, so the main difference is that, I mean, so well, in, the, in the US, you know, very well, I mean, you had this, uh, the, the, the unemployment rate went up from its probably one of its, its lowest level it ever had uh, rate uh, uh, to about 16%, 15, short of 15%, I think that was in the month, month of April last year. Um, and and in, the, in the EU, I mean, that, that movement was like barely, I mean, barely notable, I will not say, but you know, it went from seven to 8%. Uh, so there was a very limited increase in unemployment. And that is because uh, differently from the US, um, the support, cash, if you want, the cash, cash support subsidies that were given to workers uh, were given while their, mostly most of the cases, while their employment contract was still in place. Um, so this is the way how the short work schemes all work. It is actually the companies and not the individuals that apply for the, for the subsidy. And the subsidy is channeled through the companies directly to the, to the workers without interrupting that work contract. Uh, and, that is, and that is the crucial difference. Whereas in the US you had to go through, you know, basically laying off workers and then workers would apply for the unemployment benefits, uh, which is, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's a great difference. Of course, the, the EU, most EU member states or several member states had these instruments before they existed. But it is that given the nature of the pandemic uh, shock and really the expectation that this would be a, a very sharp downturn, but possibly followed by a rebound, they decided to rely on this kind of instrument. They scaled up, if you want, this instrument much more than they have done in, in, other, uh, in other business cycles. So, so fast forwarding that employment scheme, which you know, a year ago, none of us thought that we'd still be in a pandemic situation. Um, but fast forwarding through that employment scheme, that is it sustainable? So, I mean, I, I, mean, I just, um, I have a background in labor economics and I can, I can talk about this forever. Okay. Um, I mean, I think, I think, you know, ultimately the answer is, the short answer is no. Um, you know, and I, I think one should really understand what is what are the benefits of, of these schemes. These schemes actually were developed in general for the uh, manufacturing sectors uh, specifically. Um, and they are are meant to deal with shortfall, short term falls of, of, of demand without having um, you know most companies to, to undergo very painful adjustments just for what is a short term fall in demand. Uh, but, um, you know, so they can be quite effective in that, especially in the manufacturing sectors where you don't want to dismiss workers in which you might have invested a lot in their training. They have, a, you know, a human capital that matches the, the capital of, the, of your production lines and, and just this firing and hiring is very costly. Uh, so in the short term, it's very good. What it's, it's not very good, of course, is in the long term, because these, these instruments by nature tend to freeze the economy. Uh, they sort of, they, they, they freeze the, 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 the relation between the employee and the employer. And if you do this for a long period of time, 
then you just prevent that uh, natural uh, reallocation of productive uh, resources uh, of workers across firms, across, um, across sectors, which is so important just to have uh, in economic dynamism. Uh, one could also argue that on top of that, of course, they are they tend to be fairly fairly expensive uh, expensive measures, especially if you have a hundred percent replacement rate. Just to add to that, I think one of the positive benefits of these schemes is that, to the extent that people have been worried about labor market scarring after the pandemic, that you know people workers are going to be hurt by being laid off too long and it's going to be hard to reintegrate into the labor market. The the more attached that workers are to their employers, the less likely that is to happen. And so hopefully there hasn't been that much labor market scarring in Europe. Now, the question, of course, is how many of these businesses are going to remain viable in, in the post-pandemic future? And we simply don't know yet. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. Insolvencies and bankruptcies have, have been much lower than people expected, both in Europe and the United States over the past year. But that's largely because of all the public support that's been coming through, not just short work schemes, but guarantees and, and you know, other kind of programs where, you know, the fiscal support has been allowing not just households, but firms to keep operating as well. So that's, you know, a big question mark uh, how this is going to happen. But so we should expect the unemployment rate in Europe to go up a little bit in the initial recovery stage, unlike in the United States where it shot way up and then it's been been coming down. So it will, you know, the numbers will look a little bit different, but it's because the processes are, are, are a little bit different as well. Can you follow up well, by telling us about some of the, the stimulus policies, fiscal and or monetary uh, beyond the, uh, the employment schemes? Well, there's been a lot. I mean, I think one of the, the major stories of the pandemic on both sides of the Atlantic is, is just how important uh, the public sector response has been. And as Chris was saying, uh, going into this, I think the European social safety net was, it worked better than, than the one that, that existed in the United States. And so the, the US was forced to come up with these sort of ad hoc measures sending direct checks to families and the Paycheck Protection Program, which was sort of modeled after short work schemes in Europe. Um, and the Europeans didn't have to do this as much because their unemployment benefit schemes worked better and, and you know, they had these things in place. So there was less discretionary fiscal spending. But um, you know, apart from the short work schemes, I can talk a little bit about, about the, the ECB, which has done a lot uh, very similar to what the Fed has done in terms of doing lots of asset purchases, making sure that the monetary policy stance is very accommodative. accommodative. Uh, the, the PEP, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, has been a very important tool for making sure that there's been no rerun of the kind of, um, you know, spreads spreads widening for some of the, the peripheral European countries like happened in the sovereign debt crisis. That has not happened. There has not been any fr fragmentation in European financial markets. And that's been uh, really important to making sure that the, the recovery can, can happen, but you know, is also helpful politically in terms of, of making sure that the European project remains on track and, and is deepening. And I guess the other thing that we should really talk about is the, the recovery and resilience facility in next generation EU. But maybe I will let Chris jump in uh, on that if you want to transition to that now. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean just, just in terms first, in terms of, of number for specifically for the fiscal, um, you know, at least until, until the last uh, recovery package that was passed by Congress, you know, the, the situation, you know, the fiscal effort, if you want, did not look so dramatically different. It's which is it should also take into account a different starting position. I mean, you know, the, the EU as a whole had a pretty much of a balanced budget coming into the into the crisis, and it's going to end up having you know probably a deficit around eight percent for 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 past year, and the US entered with a deficit which was not close to five five um, around five percentage points of GDP. So and and you know it'll probably end up at fifteen. So all if it's we're talking about the same order of magnitude uh, and and uh, and looking forward i think also in general the fiscal effort that the member states will have in the course of 2021 
because it is so much linked to these automatic stabilizers, will necessarily be, be uh, driven by, by, the, by the pandemic and how, how quickly some of these restrictions can be lifted. Um, but so, I mean, one, one of the, uh, I would say, uh, uh, defining characteristic of, of this crisis has been, uh, first of all, the understanding from very early on that uh, the fiscal, the importance of the fiscal, of the fiscal lever. Uh, and uh, and this is uh, you know it's, I think this speaks to how important it is to get the narrative right from the beginning. Uh, the the narrative was 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 profoundly flawed in the in the euro debt crisis with the idea that it was uh, completely uh, you know a, a crisis that was driven by excessive spending um, and uh, and with excessive public spending, and it sort of uh, shaped the whole policy discourse and and the, and the way it should be uh, you know it should be tackled. Also in countries which you know we could hardly blame of having been uh, you know uh, prolificate from the from a public finance point of view. Uh, look at Ireland or Spain for that matter. Um, here I think the, the narrative was 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 established uh, very quickly. Uh, was was the right one? You know that that this was a, a an oxygenous shock that required a massive or unprecedented scale of uh, of fiscal support. And uh, and the first thing that was, I mean, was realized was, well, I mean, it's it's much easier to mobilize this at the, at the level of the member states to start with. So the European Commission um, proposed to suspend the fiscal, the fiscal rules, uh, the general escape clause, uh, uh, which basically allowed member states to, to unleash all the, 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 the the fiscal support that, that was needed. And at the same time, it also relaxed some of the uh, state aid rules because it was important that this channel could be um, give, uh, you know, uh, this, sorry, this uh, fiscal resources could be channeled to the private sectors in way which you generally do not do in, in good times, right? I mean, subsidies to firms, et cetera. But, um, you know, the very, um, uh, sort of more, more innovative part, uh, even even more innovative part, is the decision to actually supplement this uh, effort with with the member states with an effort at the level of the union. Uh, so in a way, matching what the ECB was doing with the, with the, with the uh, union wide response, and that um, you know because of the timing of that, that needed uh, um, some time to to uh, to be put in place. I mean, we, there was a bit maybe of a, of a lucky coincidence here that was that the the, the seven-year budget the MFF the multi-annual um, financial framework was being negotiated at the time when when the crisis crisis hit and and it was a uh, you know the the, the the challenge there but the, the opportunity was also to fold the, the funds for the recovery in the negotiation of, of, of this instrument. And that's, uh, um, and you know, the innovative aspect here is of course, it's, it's, it's the volume. Uh, uh, for the first time, we're, we're talking of an EU budget, which is macroeconomically significant. Um, the second one is uh, how it's going to be delivered. The fact that there is going to be transfers from the EU to the member states. And then the third maybe aspect is, uh, and we can go a little bit more into the detail about this at, at the second point, but also how this is going to be financed. It's going to be financed through a, a common emission or, or EU emission of, of debt, which per se is, a, is also a positive probably because it has the characteristic or, or it could be that, uh, you know, an embryo of a, of a European safe asset. So I think these are all, all aspects and, and this, you know, probably also contributed to the lack of, of fragmentation in the financial markets that, that Ben was referring to uh, uh, before, you know, the, the idea that uh, there was very little doubt about the, the, the solidarity of the EU response and, and this did not sort of uh, uh, come into that reappreciation of of, of risks, of credit risks, but also redenomination risks that we saw during the Euro debt crisis. Thank you. And that's the perfect segue to the next of our tag team moderators, David, who's going to be exploring some of the EU versus national themes. Thanks, Deborah. Thank, Thank you, you, Deborah. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like at this point to remind our audience that they can uh, put questions into the Q&A segment so that we can wrap them in and, and, and continue what certainly has been already a very informative uh, session for me, I hope for the audience too. Indeed, I would like to, uh, without adumbrating my colleague uh, Stephen's third segment, 
too much. Uh, I would like to talk about the tale of two federalisms that this has been. Uh, and I'd like to uh, have perhaps my focus on the role of government. And to, to frame my questions or the conversation, I, I thought it might be interesting to recall that the great British economist John Maynard Keynes uh, in 1933 wrote an op-ed to FDR uh, on what he was up to and how policy um, was shaping up in America. So we had in some ways a president of a European opinion on American uh, policy in the crisis. And so one of Keynes's key messages was that it was all about sequencing, sequencing that we have heard in terms of government policy. It was about relief, it was about recovery, and it was about reform. And I would like to begin on these three themes. Uh, could you tell us, uh, perhaps beginning with Ben, a little bit how these themes in the EU's response, the relief theme, the recovery theme, and the reform theme were distinct or were they um, uh, sort of wrapped up in one general effort? Uh, how would you characterize the sequencing uh, around these themes? Well, I mean, <clears throat> the initial efforts were all clearly about, about relief and about managing the crisis. And frankly, we're still in that stage. We haven't really yet transitioned to the recovery phase. Um, so all the things that we were talking about earlier in terms of um, you know, relaxing the fiscal rules so that member states could um, you know, run bigger budget deficits and provide some discretionary fiscal spending on top of the automatic stabilizers that were coming from the, the social safety net. That um, was something that, that happened right off the bat. Um, also the decision to give uh, the commission the responsibility of negotiating the purchases of vaccines so that you didn't have competition between all the member states. Um, all the things that the ECB did in terms of the PEP were all this stuff was very much about dealing with the, the immediate crisis and making sure that things uh, didn't, get, didn't get terrible. And I think that, you know, it, it's hard to remember, but a year ago, people really were shocked at what was going on and the economic numbers were just off the charts terrible. And in, in now that we've got a little bit in the rear view mirror, you can see that you know, the worst predictions did not come true. So that part was pretty effective. But I think it's, it, you know, the, the, the next generation EU, that's looking at the recovery. And it's, you know, very similar to some of the stuff that you hear in the United States about the Biden administration wanting to build back better. A lot of the money that's going to be spent and invested, it's going to be, first of all, that's, that's an important thing to note is that the recovery fund is thinking very much about investing in the future as opposed to you know, transfers that allow current consumption. It's not about managing demand. It's about investing in the green and digital transitions, which are, are very important in, in, in Europe politically, as well as um, you know, just the other reasons why we should care about that stuff. It's got a lot of grassroots political support. And this is going to be you know, very important, but there are strings attached in the, in the RRF. And in return for getting these grants and these loans from the European Commission, countries are going to be asked to make some structural reforms with the aim of boosting you know, potential growth and productivity in the economy a, as a whole. So we're about to transition to the stage where, where we are looking at um, you know, making sure that the, re the recovery is long lasting and that lifts living standards. Uh, but there still are these fundamental questions about balancing what happens at the at the center, the federal level, if you will, in Brussels and what member states do, but also thinking about what is the appropriate role for the state, whether it's in Paris or, or the European Commission in Brussels and what markets can do. And I think in both sides of the Atlantic, you've seen a shift towards realizing that the state really can play an effective role in, in managing these sorts of crises and getting it, getting us out. So let me stop there. See if Chris wants to add anything. Well, maybe just just uh, just to add a little bit. I mean, what, what I think it's it's um, 
to understand the differences, of course, is that uh, member states did have much more of a, of a role in the demand management, if you want. So in, in really sort of the counter cyclical uh, measures and uh, and you can see instead the union coming in here on the, on the on the supply long long term. So I think you know this is a, um, is is one one articulation, um, but but not on, not the only one because on top of of, of what uh, what uh, um, Ben referred to before, we also have had um, for example the shore mechanism, which was a way of reducing uh, the the refinancing risks. Really, it's another form of of, of subsidiarity. Was was just uh, uh, a way of of um, the European Union giving loans to member states uh, to be able to fund some of the um, um, short work schemes that we were referring to before. So um, it's it's a bit of a double double nature, if you want. So on the one hand, yes, we have the next generation EU that is is tackling a lot of these uh, longer term issues with an invest with a budget which is mostly geared to investment. Um, which comes with the with the response attached, but it also had uh, a role in the in the emergency part, uh, which were and also with 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 the ESM that ultimately was not not really used, but uh, the possibility to uh, access some emergency financing through the European stability stability mechanism um, that was you know to some extent uh, uh, made redundant by uh, by the fact that the the, the interest rates were, were also very low and then the and the ECB acted very forcefully. Let me let me uh, weave in the question that David Cleeton is asking uh, in the audience uh, and throw it to Ben. And it, it's on the topic of the we've seen the importance of, of, of fiscal policy at the EU level uh, or fiscal experimentation, perhaps even. Um, how well do we understand fiscal policy multipliers in Europe? Uh, and how well do we think uh, that the new frameworks that the EU uh, is putting in place will help towards an improved uh, understanding of fiscal multipliers? Well, I think that, you know, the fiscal multipliers from the, the recovery and resilience facility will likely be much higher than by comparison, the direct checks that the U.S. government is sending out to, to individuals and families. Uh, a lot of that money is going to be saved. Uh, whereas in Europe, when you start spending money on building, you know, upgrading your electricity grid, or you know, putting solar panels on the roof of your house, um, that has uh, you know a higher multiplier and and, and a, a bigger impact on on potential growth and productivity. So, on the one hand, I think that you can see that just in the plans of of what the recovery fund money is going to be spent on, you're going to get a little more bang for your buck in Europe. Uh, but I think that that question also sort of points to some of these proposed changes in the fiscal rules that people are starting mm -hmm. to think about in Europe. Um, and, you know, there's a widespread agreement, I would say, that the fiscal rules in Europe have to change. I don't think that there's anything close to a consensus on what they should change, you know, what, where we should end up in terms of what the new fiscal rules should be. But one thing that people are talking about is, you know, implementing some sort of golden rule where you treat uh, productive investments differently from, you know, demand management type of items. And so that would be something that that could be very important uh, if it does happen. So take, that would be taking straight the leaf out of another great 20th century economist, this time an, an American Austrian, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, this distinction between productive and unproductive credit. Uh, as it were. But uh, Chris, another question from the audience. Colin uh, has his finger on the Hamiltonian moment that this presents to the EU vis-a-vis -vis the issuance of EU-wide debt. You've alluded to, to some of it. Um, could you perhaps come back uh, to that element a little bit and tie it perhaps yeah. into the nature of, of, of reforms at the state level that some countries have made towards this? Poland and Hungary, Colin is pointing out? Um, sure, well, I mean, um, some of some people, some observers, some analysts have, have uh, you know, brought up the name of Hamilton and, and make drawn parallels uh, to, to uh, the changes uh, that, that uh, you know, what, what the next generation EU brought about. I, we probably think that this is a little bit of, of a stretch um, and, uh, and, you know, it remains, the fact, you know, the, the fact that this is uh, very much of a, of a temporary, uh, if you want, mutualization of um, 
uh, but it did only apply to, to sort of the flow that is going to be issued uh, to cover this, this specific intervention. So I think, you know, as opposed to the mutualization of all the stock of pre-existing debt that that, uh, uh, that happened with, with Hamilton. So, you know, this, we're talking about uh, two very, very different uh, different ways. But I'm, what I think it's, it's, it's interesting is in a way, it's the way the, um, it's, it revolutionized a little bit the the, um, uh, the role uh, of the relation between the member states and the um, and the uh, and the union, um, and also probably some of the way that the, the economic governance going going forward. I mean, the, it is true that that uh, you know that the what started as the as the Lisbon process, and I think nobody really uses that name anymore. But uh, uh, this idea that uh, through uh, uh, if you want a multilateral um, peer pressure of member states, you could you could advance and uh, and with the with the commission more of a, of a role as an arbiter there, uh, you know, making some recommendations, but then ultimately having very little teeth in in uh, in um, you know to to make sure that these were implemented. We are moving now into into a system where you know there there it's. You know, there are also some carrots involved, if you want, um, and, and you know, for some member states, this will be very big carrots, uh, and uh, and this is um, you know could could move to a, just a more more constructive uh, dialogue between um, that no longer sort of completely horizontal, but also between the union and the member states uh, um, on on what reforms need need to be need, need to be implemented. So. Um, I would say maybe less so on the on the on the debt front, but maybe just in the way it rebooted a little bit the economic governance within the EU. Now, having said that, I mean uh, a lot. I mean here it will depend on the implementation to the extent that this this experiment uh, works to some extent, and, mm -hmm. and that there is a shared feeling that this money was was spent on the on the uh, on the right priorities and it did contribute to uh, you know public public goods. I mean ultimately uh, growth. One can say growth in the EU is a public good in the sense that uh, there are so many spillovers to all, for, across countries but uh, I mean the environment obviously is uh, as well um, and um, and if there is a feeling that this is contribution then you know maybe that, that this instrument is something that could be uh, rolled over and then we would probably start having seen okay uh, what I described or referred to uh, to before as this an embryo of a safe assets once you, you have the impression that these safe assets is not going to be withdrawn from the market in 30 years time when it's all repaid but it's there to stay and possibly even scaled up then i think you know we are talking about uh, something very very consequential also for the way the whole arch monetary and financial architecture yeah well i would i would agree with that and just emphasize that point because you know there's this old cliche about europe being forged in in crisis and it's almost surprising how much that's true uh, because they really did, you know, come up with these new instruments and new ways of, of new tools for dealing with this economic crisis this time around. And on top of that, I think that you can see that not only is Europe moving forward in this time of crisis, but it has learned from some previous mistakes. So you, you are not hearing calls right now to begin fiscal consolidation right now. Uh, because, you know, you had fiscal tightening that happened a little bit too early before, and that left, you know, the ECB being the only game in town in terms of providing policy accommodation. This, that's not happening this time around. And with the introduction of these EU bonds, that is, yes, it's not a Hamiltonian moment in the sense that all the debt is being taken over by Brussels, but the possibility of having safe asset emerge is, is enormous for capital markets. Uh, the EU is going to issue almost 800 billion euros in bonds over the next five years, uh, going to do about 150 billion euros a year. It's going to be one of the largest issuers in Europe. A big chunk of those are going to be green bonds, which is going to transform uh, this capital market space and, and you know provide certainly the benchmark for, for green issuance. In, in this you know, really fast growing and important sector. So I think there's a lot of stuff that's happening that is a paradigm shift and, and a game changer, even if it's not exactly the same as what Hamilton did. Which, thank you. That brings me um, already to the last question that I think I have time for before I hand over uh, to Stephen. Um, a, a key element, and I'm, 
I brought this upon myself by referencing Keynes's uh, open letter to FDR. Uh, he says, ultimately, Mr. President, you know, there's been a lot of crack brand and queer, uh, foolish application of, of policies, but there has also been good stuff. Um, ultimately, what will matter is how you will convince the public, I'm paraphrasing here, um, in terms of the restoration of their faith in the wisdom of government. And certainly in the, on this side of the Atlantic, we've had uh, people express this at the ballot box and we can say that some restoration in the power of uh, wisdom and power of government has happened. How do you view this um, in Europe whilst, as he, as he hinted, uh, Ben, you know, there could be a Hamiltonian moment that's good for capital markets, but how, what do things look like? This is, I'm in, inviting you for some political speculation, how people perceive Brussels, and is there some form of um, uh, tension that's happening between how people view the national governments um, versus the, the, the centralised government? Chris, uh, could you help us from maybe <laughs> the, the Italian-Swedish perspective? Um, sure. I mean, first of all, I think uh, there, there are two, two major policy responses at the EU level, and one we, we talked a lot about the first one, and I think we might talk a bit more about the second one, which is for the, the vaccine strategy, etc., a, a bit later on. And uh, um, I think, you know, there is clearly a, a, a perception that the response put in place at the level of the um, you know, macroeconomic policy, if you want, both in, in terms of volumes, in terms of its articulation, the overall strategy, the, the ultimately even the choice of folding this in, in the in the uh, EU budget has been uh, has been appropriate, and it's you know it's obviously supported in in most member states, but also by I would. You know, I was looking at, at some some of the Eurobarometer uh, in in some of the, by the majority of people in member states that were at least a little bit more hesitant in the in the beginning. Uh, so I think you know there is there is a clear appreciation of this, um, and um, we we have had also some um, you know at least some some electoral tests in the beginning um, in, in the I mean throughout this year uh, these are quite quite minor for the moment I mean the big election cycles are still are still to come uh, but what we're seeing from these is that you know in general forces that uh, uh, tend to be very euro euro, euro skeptic etc have not performed very well it, what it didn't help is mostly that they had a very did not have most a, a very articulated strategy on how to deal with the pandemic at, at national level either. Uh, they, they, you know, I'm looking at, uh, at the case of Germany, or but, but not necessarily only Germany, where, um, you know, for example, the AFD did not have a very sort of switched position quite quite frequently. Um, in in um, member states, uh, you know, like like Italy, that um, it is clear that a, a very forceful response by the by the European Union has a bit. Uh, Change the, the, the narrative there too, uh, you know, at least when you compare it what would happen during the migration crisis, the idea of, of uh, member states being left alone and, and very little solidarity being applied here. We had a European Union that, uh, that acted swiftly, um, but also um, acted, uh, uh, you know, with the principle of, of, of solidarity. And really, um, you know, if another aspect that we didn't talk very much about the recovery fund is that uh, it is also very much targeted at those member states who have been suffering the most, um, that have been hit uh, most by, by the pandemic or because of their economic structure. So, so really, we see that the solidarity at play and that uh, that is, uh, uh, is changing very, very much also the way some of the Eurosceptic political forces are um, uh, you know, are, are interacting on, on the on the national national scene. Uh, you know, we see that now the Northern League is supporting uh, a government led by by Mario Draghi um, after having not always said very nice words about him in the past. So I think I will leave it there. Just, just to add very briefly to that, I think you know there have been the, the fact that this crisis was caused by this exogenous shock that was nobody's fault. I think helped a lot, and and you can really contrast that with the the blame game that we saw in during the sovereign debt mm -hmm. crisis ten years ago. The other thing is that the you know both both Donald Trump and Brexit I think helped convince a lot of Europeans that the European project was important and worth worth consolidating. Um, so there was a lot of 
things happening that 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 you know promoted support for Europe politically. You do have this period coming up now where we've got some important elections coming up in Germany and in France. And in the meantime, you've got to like implement this stuff right. You've got to get the recovery fund and you've got to spend the money wisely. You've got to reform the fiscal rules in a way that makes sense. You've got to get the vaccines. You've got to get shots in arms. And so there are there are risks. There are things could go wrong if, if there are problems with any of these things. And there is a tendency for a lot of member state, you know, national politics to blame Brussels when something goes wrong, even if it's not actually Brussels fault. So we will see. But I think that the underlying environment is is pretty positive for, you know, advancing a European agenda in, in a lot of European member states. Wonderful. That's all for me. And I'll hand over. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Stephen now. Thanks, David. Thank you. Yes, hi. I want to thank David for his excellent questions. And I also want to remind the attendees that we welcome your questions. And please don't hesitate to put them in the question box. Um, so I have the last leg of, of this tag team. And the thing that I would like to do is go at some broader questions. And the first one I want to ask is about some broader economic trends. In particular, I want to focus on the question of inequality. And before the COVID crisis hit, inequality between the members or among the members of the European Union was getting wider and had been for some time. And inequality within most of the member states had also been getting wider. And when you go to different groups, I would say um, when one looks at male-female inequality, that was one of the exceptions that had closed somewhat, but certainly hadn't completely gone away in the last two decades. But other forms of inequality, like between native-born and non-native-born, or between skilled and unskilled, those had been growing. And so my question is, what do you think the impact of this crisis will be on inequality among the countries of the European Union and uh, within the countries? I can take a first stab at that. Um, so, I, you know, I think this is one of the biggest questions that that we need to worry about in the in the medium term in the next couple of years, because, you know, there's been a lot of talk about these K-shaped recoveries where um, the people who've been most affected by the pandemic have been, you know, low skilled, low educated sectors of society where they've had, you know, higher infection rates, higher death rates. They've been more likely to, you know, lose their jobs in the United States or, or in Europe, you know, be on short work schemes. Um, and, you know, that's something that uh, has, has kind of been a trend for a while. And, and that's something that, that we need to keep an eye on. And then, you know, the other, the other big part about this is divergence, um, not within countries, but between countries, because uh, that's something that's been a concern for European policymakers from the very beginning. They've not wanted to see, you know, the kind of fragmentation we saw before. But the fact is, is that divergence is, is likely to increase in, in the next couple of years. Uh, you know, countries like Spain and Italy that have had, you know, a, a really sharp shock because of how important the tourism and entertainment sectors are. I mean, that stuff's going to come back, but I don't think that, you know, tourism is going to immediately come back to pre-pandemic levels. And so that means that a lot of the people who were working as, as waiters and waitresses and cooks and tour guides, not all those people are gonna immediately get their jobs back in the next year or two. And, and you know, what's gonna to happen to them? Is there gonna be labor market scarring? Is that gonna, gonna have inequality widen? So I don't know what the answer to your question is, but I think that it's one that, that a lot of people are thinking about and that is a big concern. And, and I'll see if Chris has anything to add. I think just maybe reinforce what, what Ben said. I mean, the, the, the experience with the, um, your, debt cri your debt crisis was really that it, it uh, you know, sort of brought to an end uh, some of the economic convergence that we had seen under, under many years before that. And uh, I think there was, um, you know, uh, 
we have talked about it uh, one one element before, which is just the, the importance of establishing the narrative from the beginning, the fact that it was a, an, an exogenous shock. This was very important. But I think also what was very important is that uh, um, collectively policymaker realized uh, how uh, the economic divergence that has been taking place after the uh, after that crisis has been undermining the support for the new political process um, at the project. Uh, in general, uh, and uh, a lot of the of the um, next generation EU, and spe specifically the recovery and resilience facility, the way it is going to be distributed is really trying to tackle this issue of uh, of uneven recovery and reboot, if you want, the the economic convergence. Um, uh, Pro, uh, process. Now, this is the short-term part. I mean, I would also say that, you know, looking ahead, um, the, the economic uh, sort of the, the green transition is another is another challenge uh, that, uh, you know, uh, which um, um, is going to have economic or sort of distributional implications, uh, part of it with the skilled, unskilled, but also urban, rural, across a number of, of dimensions. And, um, you know, I, I, this needs to be, uh, we need to get this right. And, you know, part of the next generation of EU is, of course, the, the Just Transition Fund, um, that is the, the part of the, of the funds to, to facilitate the, the, the transmission of, or the transition of, uh, of workers uh, across uh, sectors in decline to sectors that are, you know, probably going to have better perspectives. And uh, maybe, you know, one interesting thing is that amongst the, the, the funds in the recovery and resilience facility, they are all uh, for, for investment with one significant exception, which is resources spent on labor market, um, active labor market policies and retraining skills, et cetera. I think it's just because understanding of how important in these years ahead will be to have all, um, you know, resources available to really facilitate this, this transition. Um, Good, thank you. Uh, we got a follow-up question from Isabella, and I know I'm asking two economists uh, her question, which is a political question. And uh, so you can do your best or you can pass. You know, her question is, do you think there'll be uh, sort of nationalism that will arise out of uh, tensions that uh, come from the impact of inequality? I mean, I think rising inequality is correlated with populism and and you know that sort of uh, type of, of of political dynamic, and so that's one of the reasons why policymakers are so worried about it happening, um, you know, within their countries, uh, but also across countries. I mean, Europe as a as a project is supposed to promote convergence, and you know, I think that. It, it's been very successful in doing that, particularly if you look at, at Eastern Europe, um, you know, in, in is, you know, establishing the rule of law and bringing living standards up. But it's, it's not a smooth process, right? It goes in fits and starts and there are reversals. And when you look at other countries like Italy, you know, Italy has, has not done that great on a, on a GDP per capita level over the past 10 or 15 years. And so there, you know, that points to the need for, you know, very serious reforms to take place on the structural level in Italy so that potential growth and, and productivity can improve. And if that doesn't happen, I think we should be worried about what the political implications of that is going to be. And that's why it's important that these reforms get done. So, um... There's an interesting question that somebody posed, and it's the question, uh, and this would be, we've got some labor economists here, but you'd, you'd have to be a labor historian as well. It's been a long time since we've had this sort of demographic blow to uh, an economy. You know, you'd have to think back to the Second World War. Uh, and so I'm, and the question asks, is there going to be a demographic blow either on supply or demand uh, as a result of the COVID crisis? Are the numbers big enough? Chris, why don't you, sorry, <laughs> why don't you take a step? I mean, uh, let me just say, I, I think that sure, when ben, you go. look at, at this problem of secular stagnation and, and low growth, and, and low rates and low inflation, de demographics clearly are a part of that, right? I mean, you will get 
higher growth rates, nominal growth rates at least, if you have higher population growth. And so that I think is one of the issues why, why we've seen slower growth over the past 10, 20 years. I don't know that the, you know, the deaths from COVID itself are going to move the needle much. I haven't, I haven't looked into that, but uh, it's, it's, you know, the, the, it, it's an issue, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, we've got a question from Eleanor about, particularly about women in the labor market. And uh, when we talk about inequality, uh, we didn't touch on that. I think it'd be great if one of you would touch on that question. Well, maybe, maybe um, you know, one, one thing that is uh, worth mentioning is that in general, and, and here there, again, I keep saying in general because the picture is much more granular than that, but uh, the, the schools try to remain as much open as possible throughout the, the pandemic. In, uh, and uh, when I mentioned about the sort of the more in Europe, uh, the more, um, you know, in general, more generally stringent measures, uh, this was, was one that, you know, uh, member states were the most reluctant to go all the way to, to closing the, the uh, schools. And that's a, uh, this is in stark, I think, contrast with, with some of the um, options that were pursued uh, at the, uh, in the United States, at least in, at, in some, in some, by some local authorities. So, so um, I mean, of course, this is a, a gendered crisis. Uh, that's that's clear. It is so because of the of the industry it impacts uh, and. Um, um, which tend to be have have a um, you know great greater share of, of, of female worker. It is because of the 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 uh, you know that all this uh, uh, working from home tend to impose or <laughs> a, a higher burden on, on females. So, but I I would go um, you know um, because we haven't seen so far that sharp increase in unemployment. Uh, Yet in in the in the EU, we have not seen as much as a gender as a gender dimension to the crisis as we have here in the in the United States. Uh, now, uh, going into the into the transition, well, of course, I mean, if we are if we are talking about uh, um, um, you know uh, some of the sectors more small structurally downsized in the future, we're going to see uh, maybe some some of that uh, unemployment rates being more uh, more you know. Uh, different across for males and females. But you know, there are other transitions that we're talking about, which are going to be particularly harmful also for, for males uh, when, when we look into the into the long terms. I'm talking about you know some of the very energy sectors, for example, if you're talking about the coal uh, industry that uh, we, is, is going to be uh, permanently downsized or, or shut down. So I mean, I think there are um, several several dimensions to this, uh, and going back to the demographic, I I think you know the most important thing that that Ben alluded to in the beginning was like the scarring effect. I I don't think that it's really um, you know a lot you know the the death uh, as tragic as they are they also because they happened into were concentrated into an age a particular age group are not going to have a lot of uh, uh, labor market or labor supply impact. What you tend to have a labor supply impact is because this scarring effect, because people leave the labor market permanently, uh, or or you know, or face really difficulties in re-entering the labor market after a long period of unemployment. And to the extent that we are able, or we are able to not to have the same experience with the very uh, lengthy spell of unemployment, hopefully that the um, you know the, the impact, the long-lasting impact, will be limited. Okay. Well. I think I'm, this has been a very interesting topic and I really appreciate your um, contributions. I think we've really learned a great deal out of this. And uh, so, and I want, so I wanna thank uh, both you, Ben, and you, Chris, for your insights that you've given to the audience. And I wanna thank my fellow um, moderators, David and Deborah. I think they did an excellent job. Uh, so we are at an end. And the one thing that I would, so I want to thank everyone. And I want to thank the attendees for the excellent questions that, uh, that they gave our panelists. And I'd just like to let you know that, uh, you know, we hope that you can join us for the next Transatlantic Policy Center event. And that's taking place on April 19th. So not too far away, and on that uh, in that uh, event, uh, we will be hosting a discussion on secession movements on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, and 
we'll show a slide after, right after I'm done talking that will give you more details on the event. So again, I wanna thank our panelists. I wanna thank my fellow moderators and I especially wanna thank the attendees for participating in this event.